Hello, guys. So it's a little weird. I I told Mr. Rubfort to do uh, more videos than I thought he had to do. So he did. He's done the first video for this week, and then I realized I had not done this video yet. So I need to do the four point five video, and then four point six and four point eight will be our last uh, video for the quiz, video series and reading assignment for the quiz. I mean the test. Sorry, the test. Um, and so uh, this unit is going to be a lot of economics. Okay. Also, the person who wrote this chapter in AMSCO did not follow the style guide that the other AMSCO writers did. I assume AMSCO is written by multiple people. Um, and this person followed a very different style guide. So we'll kind of get there when we get there. But here's our, here's our gist. Unlike uh, the last Unit you know, 3 videos, I did put the gist at the, you know, I didn't need to add it just later. Here it is. And then I'm going to move to the vocab. I'm going to move my face so you can see these terms. No, 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 no. Okay. So pause me here. And then finally, pause me here. Ooh. <laughs> I got to get rid of that parenthetical. Okay. So um, we are going to get into the notes now. All right. So this chapter, this part of the chapter had like really weird organizations. They have like a thing that's like a sub sub topic. Uh, it's like these italicized things. Uh, I'm just going to kind of think of them as like evidence, but then there's like evidence kind of like deeper into it. So just try and bear with me. Okay. So ooh, gross little typo. Um, all right. So the kind of key thing we want to talk about here is that the economic systems of Europe begin to have more of an impact on global economics and politics as a consequence of their of their presence and exploitation of the people's popula the populations and uh, and resources available to them found in the Americas. So a kind of thing that comes out of this colonial this 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 this, this like maritime or sea based um, imperial system is that mercantilism, which is a system that's described to you guys in previous chapters of Unit 4, is really the dominant economic ethos. It's like how every European country that has colonies is doing mercantilism. And earlier this week, Mr. Rapport had a, has a, we had a good discussion about the ways mercantilism manifests. Um, when you guys were eighth graders and you learned American history, specifically during the American Revolution, you were you were given mercantilism as a definition that is true, but also slightly different than how AP World wants you to think about it, okay? So in your U.S. history definition, mercantilism was a system where a colony existed to economically be benefit the metropole or the home government, okay? So the 13 colonies of North America for Britain existed to benefit Britain the 13 colonies were only legally allowed to trade with British merchants. They had a monopoly as a consequence of that. Um, and that is that is part of mercantilism, right? The, the kind of control the state has over the larger trading system and ecosystem is mercantilism, as you understood it probably already. The other part of mercantilism you need to understand is that it also was about seeing all of these European states' economies as closed systems that wanted to maximize their export. So they wanted to sell as much of the stuff they produced as possible and import as little as possible. And this is mainly defined by a nation's access to silver and the silver supply that they had access to. Okay. So these, uh, so, because when you buy imports, from another country, you're using probably you're probably using silver. You're using currency that then is leaving your economic system, and that silver is incredibly valuable to your nation's economy and the stability of your state. Then, so if everyone keeps buying goods from your uh, from outside of your country, silver is leaving the circulation of your own economy. So if you import too much, you run out of silver, and then you don't have the economic means anymore to pay for larger governmental projects, right? So that's why silver is so significant. 
um, and making sure that you are selling as much as you can and buying as little as you can from other countries, right? Because if you sell a lot, you get their silver. If you buy too much, you lose your silver, okay? Now, another thing that is characterizing the growth of European economies during this period um, is the development of a concept known as capital. And capital is something that uh, today we can't exist without, like in, in our society specifically. Uh, it is the foundation of this concept called capitalism. Um, and I, the, kind of the most uh, bare bones, straightforward way I can define capital to you guys is the imagined value of a thing or an idea. Okay, so capital is when we uh, someone makes a determination that this thing is worth that much, right? Like, like this phone is worth a certain amount of value. Um, it is literally not a thousand dollars because that's usually how much like a, a, a smartphone is nowadays. Oh, unless you get, you know, it's terrible, right? It's like the products made to do this is not a thousand dollars. It's what we all kind of believe it to be. Right. So like a, a very common kind of way to think about capitalism would be like a house. Right. A house is not literally made of the money that's worth, but people believe it is worth that much money. OK. And so when people believe an idea is or a thing is worth that money, you are then said to have that much money. Right. Like if a house is four hundred thousand dollars, you have four hundred thousand dollars to use as leverage in negotiations to sell or you can't sell pieces of it you gotta sell the whole thing obviously but for example you from your families if they own a home might have gotten a mortgage before uh, a second mortgage on the house to, to pay for extra expenses or refinance their home and things like that um when the house is appreciated in value a great deal um and when we're talking about it in the context of early modern european economics the idea and potential are colonial developments in America. So it's like people believe that a expedition to establish a colony in, in Maryland is going to make a lot of money. And so when someone goes around and says, hey, I'm going to Maryland and I'd like you, I'd like you to like purchase a share of my company, a joint stock company, um, I will, uh, and I'm going to sell it. I'm going to sell you 1% for $1,000, which means I believe that my idea, my mission is going to be more, it's worth $100,000. Um, and I only have a, you know, 100 shares to give because I'm going to sell 1% at a time. If you buy that, you are agreeing that this idea is going to be worth $1,000 and $100,000, and you are entitled to 1% of the profits that this adventure will make, this venture will make. Um, and so what happens in Europe is that these ideas and these like kind of economic actions have so much consistent success, people are encouraged to continue to imagine greater and greater values of these kinds of events, okay? And this is what leads to the commercial revolution, which is when like the European eco economic system explodes in a way that within 200 years of it coming into existence eclipses your other Eurasian economic systems that have been dominant for most of human history um, until the, uh, the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Um, so this is the start of Europe becoming this predominant force that dominates the, 20th, the 19th and 20th centuries, right? Like now in the 21st century, we're experiencing a different kind of um, power equation where nations like China and India, Brazil are ascending in a way that's different. But for the past 200 years, Europe and nations inspired by European systems are been the predominant economic, political, and social influences and cultural influences of the world. So colonies, you can understand how that makes sense, I think. Um, international trade routes, the transatlantic trade routes, and then the transatlantic to Indian trade route and vice versa. The Pacific trade route, of um, Spain, sometimes in the Pacific, that's not as significant um, during this period because the Pacific is so big. Um, so like, but the big one is the transatlantic trade route linking with the Indian Ocean trade route. That's kind of the big new one. Um, the Columbian Exchange and also the potential of economic growth leads to enough people, uh, uh, first of all, enough food so people don't starve to death. So people are willing to have children more. So populations grow more. 
And then a really big thing that happens because the economy is growing so fast is this idea of inflation, okay? And inflation is a concept, again, that's really important to understand um, for this co- for this like unit and also just economics in general. Um, inflation occurs when uh, demand exceeds supply. So when it, people want something and there isn't enough of that thing to meet, to give everyone who wants it that thing, the price of that thing is going to increase. I think I'm, I think I'd probably make a lot of sense to you guys, um, right? Like if there's one candy bar and all of us are hungry, the person who owns the candy bar can sell that candy bar for a pretty high price, a higher price than what we might have if we all of us, there are 30 candy bars, right? And y'all were hungry, right? So um, because there are so many things and changes and opportunities in the European economy during this period, the demand for opportunities exceeds, like people want to get in at the ground floor, the next big thing. And that leads to prices increasing. And so everything in Europe also becomes more expensive, but in a lot of ways, economic growth is still exceeds the growth of inflation, right? Which is always, which is okay, right? Inflation is fine. It's a natural process as people get access to more goods. However, if uh, so long as what people are earning meets infla- uh, it exceeds inflation, people are actually making money, making more money because of that. And one concept that is instrumental in expanding the opportunities available to people who have the capital to invest in these economic ventures is the concept of a joint stock company. So a joint stock company is a company that is owned by a collective of people who are entitled to the profits the company produces, right? So, you know, like there's a, there are expenses in a company and there's revenue in a company and the surplus, if there's a surplus of revenue, things that come into a company, um, to expenses, things that come out of a company, um, then you have profits and the profits are redistributed to the people who, um, to the people who own 8% of the company. So if you own 10% of a company, and the company makes $100 in profits, you make $10 of their profit. That is redistributed to you, okay? And what's really cool about that is you can distribute the expense and risk of economic ventures. So that means if there is like a merchant expedition that's going to go to India, buy a bunch of crap, then come back to Britain and sell those in the British market, you can say, oh, I want to, I want to spend 10% of like, I want to buy 10% of this venture and I am, and it costs like a thousand dollars to do that. So I'm going to pay a thousand dollars and I'll own 10% of this venture. That venture is used to pay for the goods. It's used to pay for the salaries of the employees who are going to work on that boat. The boat goes to India, gets its stuff. And we're going to talk about two realities. First, the first reality is that the stuff comes back from India loaded with goods. It sells all the goods. It costs, you know, was it $10,000 to, to make it all happen? It makes $100,000 and you own 10%. So for the $1,000 you spent, you now made $10,000. That's really cool. Or in the alternate reality, they sink on the coast of Africa and all the goods are lost. You have spent $1,000, but you didn't spend ten. dollars thousand dollars right you didn't spend ten so you are you the other the ten thousand dollars has been lost but now ten people who all bought ten percent each are encumbering that risk and that risk is now less impactful if that makes sense i hope that does save it for a book talk if it doesn't so um the this what this means is that people can take more risks in their investments which means more investments can occur, which means more ventures go out, which means more trade occurs and expands, which means more money is made, right? So all of this is leading to the expansion of European economies as well. It's a two-parter on, on, this, on this page. So when we talk about commerce and finance, I have no idea why they put it in here. Uh, finance makes sense. Commerce makes no sense in this particular example. They talk a lot about the Dutch. The Dutch are kind of crazy in this moment, and that they're like they're kind of 17th century is very much a Dutch moment, and then the Dutch moment kind of 
wraps itself up pretty quickly. Um, so like the Dutch get colonies and themselves trading post empires across the world. They have faster ships. Um, there's kind of a very interesting historical anecdote that exists with um, the Dutch and the tulip trade. So something that became that got assigned a great deal of value during the during this time of Dutch wealth were tulips, um, the, like the flowers. Um, and so um, people would people were willing to pay higher and higher prices for specific kind of tulips. And actually, what's really interesting is like some of the most valuable tulips were kind of tulip where the coloring kind of like splintered and there were like streaks of white throughout the tulip. It looked like, like, like kind of like stained glass in a way. And that was a caused by a virus actually, like a virus in the tulip, like was allowed to like probably propagate because that was a, a desired aesthetic of Dutch to the Dutch tulip market. So people are paying more and more money for these tulips, like hundred thousand dollars in today's money, $400,000. Like eventually like a tulip is being sold for the price of a home in Amsterdam. And then one day someone says, someone, a, a tulip is set up part of the market for a really high price and no one buys it. And the whole reason why people were buying these tulips was because the idea is you could sell that tulip later for more money. But now a tulip was at a high price and no one bought that tulip. So they had told every person who was what's called speculating on the tulip market that these tulips didn't matter anymore. And so they all tried to sell their tulips and at their high prices. No one bought their tulips. So the price of tulips plummeted. And so when that occurred, the Dutch economy had a moment of crisis because no, they had all this capital tied up in tulips. People are like funding, like investing and buying 10% of tulips. Like it's like, it's like that kind of moment. So people are financially ruined by the tulip bubble bursting. A bubble is when a, a, um, a object is appropriated higher value than its actual value because willing or people are willing to pay that value. Um, for example, houses in Austin are very much in in a bubble in a lot of ways because they are being sold for extremely extremely high price, even though houses seem like they're not worth that actual value, um, and that can be a problem, right? Because like people's wealth are tied up in their homes and stuff like that. Um, speculation in general is one of the greatest risks of stability within a capitalist economic system. When people begin to try to predict the future value of goods without a kind of regulatory measure that can get out of control, people can overinvest in a speculative market. They tie up their finances in a thing because they believe it's going to be extremely valuable. And then when they, then that value busts or, or that bubble bursts, the person's like value is all tied up in a thing that no longer is valuable. And so they lose all that money. And so speculation caused this tulip problem, but also caused the Great Depression in the 1920s. It caused the Great Recession in 2008, in a way, in a way, in a way. <laughs> uh, but uh, Great Depression is a more better example of like the dangers of speculation. The final part of the commercial revolution would be the triangular trade. Um, so this is the idea you probably learned about it in your um, American history class, right? It is a triangle between America, Africa, and uh, Af um, sorry, America, Africa, and Europe. America produces goods uh, through the use of slave labor, raw materials. Those raw materials go up into Europe. Uh, early industrializing and productive processes turn that raw material into goods of value. Um, refined goods that are then sold to Africa to develop wealth, to then purchase slaves, to then go to Africa to increase the production of raw materials, to then go to, to Europe to be turned into more refined materials, to be sold to Africa to get more slaves, yada, 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 yada. Um, and then finally, Indian Ocean trade is another thing, a part of the com commercial revolution. Um, and then they proceed in this part to not talk ever about rivalries in, for the Indian Ocean trade. Uh, because the Europeans dominated the wealth of Atlantic Ocean trade, like there aren't many uh, Ottomans engaged in Atlantic trade. There aren't many West Africans getting all the way over to America to trade. There, I'm going to presume they did happen, but uh, it's not common enough to be significant, um, which means that the Europeans have more wealth and they channel that wealth into gaining market shares and control of other trade routes, specifically the Indian Ocean trade route, because the Indian Ocean trade route feeds into the Atlantic trade route. So like in Portugal, 
they also they go into there. Also controlling the West African co- coast becomes a value too. So Portugal fails to expand into North Africa, but wants to. When Morocco eventually conquers Songhai, West Africa becomes more politically disunited than it ever had been before. When in, in that power vacuum, Spain and Portugal expand into that area and develop colonies and trading posts along the West African coasts. And so, like for example, you, you probably have heard of those slave fortresses. Um, uh, many of those slave fortresses are Spanish and Portuguese possessions. Because uh, remember, if you don't know this, most slaves go to Portugal. I mean, go to Portuguese possessions in America. A majority of the slaves that came from Africa are sent to Brazil, um, despite how essential and important the history of slavery is in the United States. It is, it is, it is like I think it's like 50, over fifty percent of the slaves that come to America are are sent to Brazil. Okay, changing continuities uh, in trade networks. So monopolies are are developed by the state. The state encourages, in many ways private industries to have monopolies over um, certain industries, specifically in their trade relationships with the new world, new, new world and European perspective. So for example, colonies could only trade with British Britain uh, with like with merchants from the home nation. So the colonists of the 13 colonies, could not trade with Spanish and French merchants, and it gave the British merchants a great monopoly, which means they could p- buy American goods at whatever price was available, what they were willing to pay, because the 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 Americans had no other market. I didn't mean they didn't challenge that. the The black market with the French and the Spanish was definitely really big, um, but uh, that is one of these key kind of points of tension between the thirteen colonists, thirteen colonies, colonists, and and Britain. But also, I want you guys to keep in mind that um, these ongoing regional markets that you've learned about in Unit 2 last period, like 1200, 1450, persist and are transformed by this, these new trade transformations. So this is, a, this is a continuity. Like The Silk Road still matters. The Trans-Saharan trade still matters. The Indian Ocean trade still matters. It's just what's on those trade routes now are now including a variety of Colombian goods. And the thing I always like to talk about is it's really kind of a fun, interesting personal story because uh, my wife is Iranian. And um, there's a dish she makes. It's really good. It's a really good little Persian dish. Uh, it's called Istanbuli Polo. Um, and it is essentially like it's a, it's a rice, ground beef, green bean um, dish with tomato paste in it. Uh, you can, and you can imagine where I'm going here. So Istanbuli in Farsi, which is what they speak in Iran, is um, it means Istanbul. And the reason why it's called Istanbuli Polo, I would have theorized, is because tomatoes probably came into Central Asia through land-based networks with the Ottoman Empire. Uh, that uh, and also, I mean, also could have come through like the Indian Ocean Trade Network. I wouldn't see that. I don't see how that wouldn't be a problem either. Um, I just want to kind of think why why they might call it assembly polo. Or you wonder what would assembly polo be like before tomatoes entered uh, the diets of people around the world, right? So that is like it, it, the Silk Road is essential for tomatoes getting to Iran, um, but it and that's from uh, America. But it uses a Silk Road probably, or could have used a Silk Road to get there, right? So that's like going to kind of see how these trade routes still exist. The Silk Road's influence certainly wanes, right? Like it's probably still selling the same amount of stuff. Like people are still using the Silk Road significantly. It's just now there's an entire new continent, America, that's entered into the economic system. And that has that leads to a massive expansion of the economy of the world, right? Because now this is the first time that the world is truly globalized. Like this is when what is going on in South America could impact East Asia. In fact, it very directly does. Um, so that's like uh, so that's why this period, 1450, 1750, is like my favorite period. Um, however, my least favorite part of this period is the slave trade, of course. Um, so uh, one consequence of this would be, of the slave trade, would be that population growth slows. It doesn't decline, despite the fact that 
Africans are forcibly removed from Africa. Like that is still something that is, um, it's still the population grows. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but Africa grows slower than other places because of, of um, the maritime empires. Uh, also though, states become more, in Africa, become more dependent upon European states because of the refined goods that they're selling to uh, Africa. So for through triangular trade. And when I say refined goods, I'm saying anything that's like produced like in a factory or like multiple raw materials turned into like one kind of product, right? So like a gun is a good example of that, right? So like a gun is a refined good because you, know, you just don't grow guns on trees, right? That's what a raw material is. So one of the key things that are being sent to African states in exchange for slaves are firearms. Um, and so the states that are able to interact with the slave trade the most effective are like states like Dahomo, Dahomey and Oyo. Dahomey is the principal kind of place where that new movie, the Af it's like the Queens of Africa or the African Queen or something like that. Um, and and then and, and I I came across some TikToks. People trying to like, were really mad about this film, uh, being the historical drama that it is, because it betrays Dahomey, which was a slave state, like it, it was funded and enabled by slavery, but they're like the protagonist of the story. Um, I haven't seen the movie yet. I think what you kind of get is that like just because the story centers about around them, it is not elevating them to be heroes, right? That's not. It's a historical film. You don't need to have hi heroes in history. That's something we appropriate to history. That's not necessarily something that always needs to happen. Um, but the Hoyo and Oyo use, um, and I know you guys are going to ask in a book talk, what's the difference between them? That's why I define the terms differently. Um, and I can talk, you, your teacher will be able to talk about that in a book talk. Um, slavery changes gender relations because m men are preferred laborers. So men are more men are extracted from Africa and sent to America, which means there are more women, which means that polygamy, which is a practice that is that was done in West Africa, if you recall, in unit one. But there is now a material reason that's different than the maybe cultural or social practice of polygamy. Um, New foods come, and this is where the population grows, right? Because this food, the increased availability of food like um, maize, corn, um, peanuts, cassava, and yucca, these are all these are all like high, heavily starchy crops uh, that can increase the caloric intake for people, and uh, that means the population grows. It just grows slower than other places because of um, the slave trade. And then finally, uh, for indigenous people, which I guess they grouped in here with the slave trade, <laughs> this AMSCO chapter is a mess. And that's, I feel really bad that this video is as long, they're getting longer and longer each year, uh, each time. I'm sorry, guys. Um, Viceroys, as I have written on the, on the slide, um, were the executives appointed, they were typically members of the aristocracy appointed by the King of Spain to rule as the King of Spain in, in America because you couldn't depend on the king to adequately respond to the immediate needs of Spanish settlers in America because there was an Atlantic Ocean in the way. And so audiencias, which I think is how you say it in Spanish, but my Spanish is terrible, um, were practices established where settlers could appeal directly to the viceroy who would speak in the stead of the King of Spain. Right, so they were seen as like they were seen as political equivalents in this kind of context. The viceroy would always defer to the king of Spain, but the king of Spain trusted the viceroy to make day-to-day -day decisions regarding policies in New Spain and the and variety of the viceroyalties. Because you have like the viceroyalty of New Spain, just like modern-day Central America and Mexico, the viceroyalty of Peru, the viceroyalty of Rio de Plata. Uh, those are all different places. I think there's one more. I can't remember what it is at the moment. Um, culture changes. The Spanish came in, wiped out, attempted to exterminate indigenous culture. They, they, they enforced their own cultural practices on these people. But because these people, indigenous people, had existed in one culture for their lives pre-Columbian contact and then were introduced to a new culture, they could not – you cannot – forget culture, like, especially within your lifetime. Like, if you have a practice that you pursue, like, you're not just going to stop celebrating December 25th if you're a Christian because they say Christmas is outlawed, right? Like, you are still going to at least even find that they just, at minimum, significant, right? Because your entire life is kind of orbited around the pacing of, like, that date being significant. 
Um, so a Creole culture develops, which is like an Amer. There's two terms for Creole, and and the Spanish term would be Criollo, um, which is like uh, I, 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 C R I O L L Y O, I think. And um, Creole, Creole, it's defined two ways. You, I, it is either like the blending of European, American, and African culture into one thing, or like the blending of Indian and American and uh, European culture or African and, and uh, American culture or African and European culture. All of those are Creole cultures. It's a blend. It's a cultural diffusion. Um, but then also Creoles are also the term the Spanish used to define a European descended person, a fully white person who is born in America, which was seen socially inferior to what was called a peninsulare who had been born in Europe, a European descended person born in Europe, right? So this is our final slide. Yes. So belief systems are kind of tacked down at the end here. Um, they give you some really interesting different belief systems uh, to talk about. They're all syncretic in that they are a blend of African or indigenous or um, and European religious systems, which European, I mean, Christianity and but mainly Catholicism. And it's kind of like where they are, and that's why that's how they kind of to, 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 to like distinguish them. So Santeria uh, means like the way of the saints. West Africans were you know forced to go to America. They also interact with Christianity. Many many are forcibly converted to Christianity and Catholicism, and so they don't forget their other practices. And um, Santeria was mainly in Cuba. Um, and it exists today, like it's still a practice today. All these are still practiced today, I think. Um, and Cuba is Spain. So this is a Spanish syncretic religion. Vodun, Vodun or Vodun, I think is if it's probably if it's French, is voodoo, as we call it in America, in the United States, um, is West African religions with French Christianity, again, on sugar plantations, because sugar is the most important commodity um, for and in, in most colonial experiences, actually. And then, oop, candomblé. Candomblé, that sounds good, uh, is the Portuguese, the one that the syncretic faith that develops in Brazil. They're all, they are not the same. So they are taking parts of West African belief systems and parts of Christianity and maybe the same parts of Christianity, but they are coming to different conclusions and different practices. And so they're all different geographically, specifically, and the geography, the uniqueness of the people who are living these religions, and also the, like, they're not all coming from the same West African practices, uh, right, religious practices. So all of them are different, but they all are syncretic religions developed in European colonies among African peoples, okay? Islam also is significant because, you know, we would assume that Muslims would be uh, imported as slaves because it, Muslims were a significant part of... So uh, Islam would, of course, be a part because we know that West Africa is partially Islamic. So about 10% were Islamic, but very few were even seen to be Muslim. Um, in Latin America, Catholicism became the predominant religion in America. Uh, but however, some syncretic practices that came out of that would be the appearance of specific characters within the practice of indigenous Christianity in um, specifically like Mexico was the example they're using, which is the Virgin, Virgin of Guadalupe, um, which is a... Uh, women of indigenous descent who I would not call her exactly like just a, 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 a woman of color who is the Virgin Mary. I don't think that's exactly, that's, that's not the exact thing. Um, but it is like, there are, there is a relationship between them. Um, and then we have, you know, Sufis, Akbar being chill for a second. Um, and then just in general, religious war is a common theme to talk about. And the, Wars of religion that occur in Europe, the wars of religion between the Safavids, Ottomans, and Mughals, like that is something that's really important. But also how Europeans are treating Native Americans is something that links into those stories too. Because um, the forcible conversion and violent conversion of Aztec peoples, Inca peoples, like those are, again, conflicts that are very similar in their brutality and in their motivation to the 30 years war or the Ottoman Safed conflict or the Mughal Safed conflict. So 
this, the, the Unifor, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I get out, it gets out of hand, guys. Uh, but hopefully this can kind of give, more, give you some more context. Um, I, I don't know how, if your teachers tell you about your WAP quizzes, how your, your class averages. Um, in the first Unit 4 quiz, you guys were amazing. The average was an 88. Um, and so I think it's really important to know, see that, like, you as a group of learners are growing. Like, you are, you are so much better than you were at the beginning of the year. Um, and that's one way to quantify it. And, you know, maybe they still haven't clicked for you yet. But I see my, the people in my class every day getting better and better at this stuff. And I know that all three of us could be more proud of you guys. I don't know why I'm getting all sentimental right now. Uh, I'll see you guys in class or see you guys in the next video.